Good afternoon. My name is Tom Nastic, and I'm the public pro program producer here at the National Archives. Uh, thank you all for coming today uh, as Washington uh, continues to dig out from the big snowstorm. Uh, and a special welcome to those of you who are watching us on our YouTube channel. Uh, today, our series of noontime author lectures continues with First Entrepreneur, How George Washington Built His and the Nation's Prosperity with our special guest, Edward G. Lengel. Before we get to today's program, I'd like to tell you about two upcoming programs that will take place in this theater. On Thursday, February 4th at 7 p.m., filmmaker Aviva Kempner and author and journalist Alelia Bundles will be here to screen and discuss Kempner's documentary, Rosenwald, a remarkable story of a Jewish partnership with African-American communities. And then on Tuesday, February 9th at noon, uh, Alelia Bundles will be back uh, to join author Alondra Nelson in a discussion of Nelson's book, The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome, which takes us on a journey into how the double helix has wound its way into contemporary social issues around race. And a book signing will follow that program. To find out more about these and all of the National Archives programs, exhibits, and events, please co consult your monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby, and you can also check us out online at www.archives.gov. Edward G. Lengel is Editor-in-Chief of the Papers of George Washington and a professor at the University of Virginia. He is the author of several books, including General George Washington and This Glorious Struggle. A lecturer on Washington and the Revolutionary War, Lengel is also a historical consultant advising on such works as the History Channel's own comprehensive documentary. He is a frequent radio and television guest appearing on C-SPAN, CBS, NPR, among others, and is a regular contributor to newspapers and magazines in the vein of military history and American heritage. After his talk and questions from the audience, he'll be signing copies of his book upstairs outside the archives store. Would you please welcome Edward G. Lengel back to the National Archives. Good afternoon, and thanks to all of you for braving the weather to come in here to hear me talk. I got here just in the nick of time, driving up from Charlottesville and coming into 66, which was a parking lot, but I, I made it here literally with minutes to spare. George Washington believed in infrastructure. He was a big believer in infrastructure for communications and transportation, and what would he have done at Valley Forge in weather like this? Uh, that's a question perhaps we should leave for the end. I am director of the Washington Papers Project. As Tom informed you, I have been working there since 20 years ago, actually, I began at the Washington Papers. And uh, I was originally a European historian, modern European history. And so I came to the Washington Papers from a completely different direction. It was my first job out of graduate school. So I began to learn about Washington day by day through reading his correspondence and through learning what he did almost in between the great moments, kind of getting at him through the details. Because if you, if you read his correspondence, it's not one explosive dramatic moment after another. It's a lot of deep thought, a lot of study, a lot of detail in preparation for some of those great moments and moving in between and back and forth uh, between the great moments. Uh, so it takes time to get to know him. And being a military historian too, which is how I view myself, I tended to think of him as a soldier. We see Washington in a number of different guises. Uh, we'll see him as a president, a politician. We'll see him as a soldier. We'll see him as a family man. Uh, we'll see him as a slave holder and all of the, the results of that. But one aspect of Washington that we don't see is Washington the businessman. And it, it really took me a long time to begin to see him through that prism. I, I think one of the problems we have with Washington is that, that we tend to see him frozen at certain different moments of time. We'll see him standing there almost as if he'll put on a different uniform from one moment to the other, depending on how he's appearing uh, in any particular guise. And we forget that he was a man constantly in movement, constantly in the process of change. Uh, 
So we at the Washington Papers have collected approximately copies of approximately 140,000 documents. It's a huge collection. And uh, these are, this is correspondence written to Washington and from Washington. But then there are a whole lot of other documents in there too. There are ledger books and account books and piles and piles of receipts and reports and farm reports of some of the most fascinating documents in Washington's collection. We began with his correspondence, letters to and from in different series, and uh, worked our way through. We finished everything except the last couple years of his presidency. Actually, the last year is where we are right now. We're finishing that up. And the latter years of the Revolutionary War. We finished everything else. A number of years ago, it was 2009 actually, uh, some folks at our project began to look more closely at these other records that we had kind of left to the side. All of those ledgers, account books, receipts, et cetera, et cetera. And, and when you look at them, they've really not been valued in the past. Collectors tend to zero in on the correspondence, particularly correspondence pertaining to great events. And they say, oh, these financial records, who cares about all of that? But if you, if you take another look at them and you zero in and you see the thousands of people who are referenced and the thousands of commodities that are referenced and all the different ventures that George Washington was involved in, you see a whole different world there. So in, um, we began to think about publishing them. Uh, we had originally thought of publishing them in a letterpress edition, but these things are so complicated that uh, that soon proved impossible. We decided to drop that, that option. And instead, in 2012, thanks to a grant from the National Historical Publications and Records Commission, an arm of the National Archives, we, were be able, we began a three-year project at the University of Virginia to transcribe and publish all of these documents in a free access digital edition. And we just had a, a demonstration of this edition at Mount Vernon a couple of weeks ago, and it floored everybody. The, the complexity of the content and all of these things that you can discover. And especially exciting is beginning the end of the summer, again, thanks to the National Archives, all of these documents, all of these materials will be freely available to everybody on the Mount Vernon website. You can go in, you can study the documents, you can play around with them, you can convert currencies, you can see videos, there's a little map that shows Washington's movements based on his accounts, uh, and you can download data based on the different commodities that he was involved in. So it's, it's really an exciting tool that will be valuable for everybody. So what can these documents show us? What can they show us about George Washington that's really different? And for me, I have to admit it was a struggle to write a book based on Washington's business dealings, his attitude toward the economy, and his attitude toward business, and his attitude toward money. It was not unnatural for me. Again, being a military historian, not an economic historian, but I've come to know Washington very well. It, it practically shocked me to learn how much money and economics occupied his mind from the very beginning of his life. And we tend, we look at it through 21st century eyes we almost think, oh, this is something a little bit unsavory. He shouldn't be thinking about money this much, should he? I mean, if you, if you talk to friends and they ask you, well, what are you thinking about? I'm thinking about money. <laughs> and the tendency is to think, well, you're, you're a greedy individual, aren't you? But in fact, money for Washington was not just a, a personal matter. It was a matter for family. It was a matter for community. And ultimately, it was a national matter. What he did with his estate had national implications. And what the nation did with the nation's economy 
had implications for him, for his family, for his community. And he really believed that ultimately economics were the, the fundamental issue determining freedom or not freedom, and even morality or immorality, and prosperity or poverty. So these thoughts were really fundamental to him. And I'm in the, the brief time that I have available now, I'm going to go through different stages of his life, look at some of his own business dealings, look at some of his attitudes towards the economy based in his documents and based in his financial records. And really to get an understanding of why this was important to Washington, you need to even start before George Washington and look at his family. The first Washington of George Washington's branch to arrive in the colonies in North America was John Washington, his great grandfather who arrived in 1656. Now Virginia at that time was all about tobacco. Tobacco was the boom crop, it was the, the essential commodity of the whole Virginia economy. Everybody was planting it. Everybody was growing it. And you would think there would immediately be a glut on the market, that tobacco would you know, pass its peak pretty quickly. But as technologies improved and labor-saving sa devices improved, tobacco pr proved to be quite an enduring crop. So John Washington came from England. His intention when he arrived in 1656 was to pick up some tobacco and take it back to England and sell it there. He had no intention of staying in Virginia. Well, his ship sank. Right as he loaded it up with tobacco, he's ready to go back to Virginia. The, the storm came in and it foundered. So John exhibited uh, a couple of the traits that would pass down through his family. One was a quick adaptability. Oh, he's faced with a disaster. How is he going to adapt? The other one is that the Washingtons are really good at marrying the right women. <laughs> They're really good at that. So John Washington marries a woman who's an heiress from uh, the Virginia gentry who has quite an, a substantial inheritance, uh, quite a substantial dowry. Um, and she's also a great partner for him. And uh, they get married, and he decides to stay in Virginia, and he builds up his estate. He grows. He purchases more land. He begins to diversify. He begins to, he begins to expand and become a more substantial planter. He dies young. He's only 38 years old when he dies. That's another unfortunate Washington family trait. His son Lawrence tries to do the same thing. He dies when he's 46 years old. Lawrence's second son, Augustine, who was George Washington's father, is a, a fascinating man, and we tend to only see him through the Parson Weems fables, the, the cherry tree story, when uh, George Washington chops down the tra cherry tree, supposedly, and his father says, did you chop this down? And George says, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped down the cherry tree. And we, we tend to see Augustine as a, kind of a, a very loving, very paternal figure, who tragically died when George was only 11 years old. <clears throat> Augustine was more than that. He was a very savvy businessman. He too expanded his land holdings dramatically. He continued to work with tobacco, but he decided to get into iron work. There was something called the Principio Iron Works. Somebody discovered that there was a, 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 some excellent land for uh, developing iron foundries. So what Augustine did is he bought, he bought up all the surrounding land and he began to develop an industry uh, in connection with some English partners and became very prosperous through that. Now, his first wife died young, <clears throat> left him a son named Lawrence, and Augustine had to find a woman for his second wife. And he settled upon, and of course she settled upon him, Mary Ball, to become Mary Ball Washington. And she is one of the most underappreciated women 
in American history for a lot of different reasons, and she's really underappreciated in George Washington's life. Her firstborn son was George, George Washington, born in 1732. Now, Augustine and Mary Ball were excellent partners. And one of the things that Augustine liked about Mary was that she was a strong woman, she was dedicated, she was very intelligent, and she knew how to run an estate. She knew how to manage a business. When Augustine, as he often had to do, was running off uh, to different parts of Virginia, going overseas to England, working out various business deals, he had to have somebody to keep things running. And Mary did that at the same time that she's raising several children, as well as Augustine's children by his first marriage. This was one tough lady and one very smart lady. And yeah, she's come down to us, we, we tend to see, because George didn't like her later on in his life. He had problems with her. We say she must have been bad. She wasn't. She raised George, you know, particularly after Augustine died when, uh, like many Washingtons, he died young. Augustine died when George was only 11 years old. Now there's been some debate, would George have gone off to England for his schooling, like uh, many young men did, if Augustine had not died? We're not sure, but we know for certain that once Augustine died, there was no chance of his being sent to England. He had to stay in Virginia. Nor did Mary feel that they could afford to give him a formal education. And George would lament that later on in his life. But what he got from Mary, who directed his education and from his tutors, was a very practical education. It was based in things like geometry, and mathematics and accounting with a little bit of classics, a little bit of the liberal arts on the side, but her attitude was, George, you need to learn how to manage this estate. It's going to come down to you eventually someday and you're going to need to grow and you're going to need to build your estate. So his education was very practical, but there were also some fundamental principles that he got from his mother. They were things like thrift and diligence and almost fanatical accounting and record keeping, which George kind of liked anyway because he was really a detail guy. If you, you look at his early school exercises, he, he was the type of guy who you gave him a dictionary or an almanac or something, he would find it immensely fascinating, would, would pour over it and learn more and more about it. He liked to keep records. She also taught him an absolute horror of debt. And I like to say that among the things that, that Washington feared and detested most in his life were Thomas Jefferson and debt. <laughs> Maybe Tom came first, I'm, I'm not sure, especially later on in his life, but early on in his life, debt was the, the, the main fear. Now George, when he's a teenager, he's, he's a dreamer, he's like a, a lot of young men in his teen years, he imagines for a while his older half-brother Lawrence mentors him and sells him on this cockamamie idea that he's going to go off to sea on a, on a British merchantman. And George is ready to go and his bag's packed. He's about to get on the ship when Mary, thankfully for all of us, his mother puts her fist down and says, there's no way you're getting on that ship. You're going to stay here and you're going to tough it out and you're going to learn. Shortly afterwards, a few years later, thanks to his connections with the Fairfax family, and the Fairfax family was the most powerful family in Virginia at that time, their estate based at uh, Belvoir. Belvoir is one of the great houses that you just wish had survived, one of the great estates. It burned down later on during George's lifetime, but it, it must have been a magnificent, magnificent place. George tended to spend a lot of time there with the Fairfax family, uh, through his connections with the Fairfaxes, he got his first job as a surveyor in his teenage years. Now, for, for many of us, and particularly for me, their first teenage job is a nightmare, and you don't want to remember it. 
For George, his first teenage job was a smashing success. He got to survey for the proprietor and for Lord Fairfax, and then later for the Fairfax family uh, through different parts of Virginia moving out toward the valley, and uh, eventually was able to set up a trade on his own account to earn money surveying for different landholders in different places. And the, the surveying career taught him a lot, again, about fundamentals, basics, how to understand the land, how to judge the richness of the soil, and, and now land is fundamental to Washington's wealth. I'm gonna get back to that, and to the national wealth. But to, to be able to judge the land, judge the topography, to be able to measure, to be diligent, and how to earn money and to save it. Now he has a couple of problems early on. He's an easy touch for a loan, uh, particularly with family members and friends. Uh, they'll go after him as soon as they say, hey, hey, George is earning a lot of money. Hey, can you give me a loan? And then they don't pay it back. He learns some of those lessons early on. Uh, also, he does enjoy gambling. He does enjoy a throw of the dice. He does enjoy cards. He does enjoy billiards. I wish somebody would uh, create a painting of Washington playing billiards. I would just <laughs> love to see that. Or him around a card table playing uh, uh, playing poker or something like that. Um, he, he, he doesn't gamble excessively, but he, he loses money and he learns through some hard lessons um, elements of self-discipline. Well, the French and Indian War comes around in 1754. And uh, I won't get into detail of the French and Indian War because it's a bit outside my topic. Suffice to say that George believes that this is going to be an opportunity for him to earn some distinction. You have to put him in the context of his time. Yes, he was a young man, 22, 23 years old, at the beginning of the French and Indian War, who, like many young men, yearns for adventure, and he yearns for an opportunity to achieve glory. But he is a member of a certain class, a certain social class, the Virginia Gentry, the Virginia gentry are the closest thing that we ever had to a native aristocracy. The Virginia gentry are about perception. They're about how you appear, what type of figure you put on, what type of plaudits have you won, what type of honors, distinctions, offices have you, have you held. Uh, if you look at some early images of George Washington, and particularly you look at uh, other images of other members of the gentry in the mid-18th century, we tend to look, there's a portrait by uh, Charles Wilson Peale right after the French and Indian War that, that he made of Washington. And you look, how did this guy get so fat? Because his, his belly is kind of sagging out, and you see even a couple of buttons are missing. That was about perception. It doesn't mean that necessarily he had put on a lot of weight. It means that that perception of easy living, that perception of having plenty to eat, of being relaxed, of living well and living sumptuously was very important. The French and Indian War was also about George earning the street cred so that he could belong to the Virginia gentry. He learned some tough lessons in the French and Indian War, how to manage men, but the most important lesson that he learns is fundamentals. Details matter. If you're going to manage any type of an enterprise, you need to study and learn the details. He learns one of the very basic things that he learns. If men aren't paid, they're not going to fight. We can get angry about that. We can rant and we can rave. Now, how dare you? You have, you have a, you know, an, a cause to fight for. You have a goal to fight for. And you're talking about money? What kind of a person are you anyway? George learns that that's, that's a ridiculous attitude to take. That these men have families. They have lives. They need to live. That sounds simple to us. At that time, it was not simple that any commander needs to understand those basic facts. After the French and Indian War is over, 
George has come into the estate of Mount Vernon. He's come into that estate, it's, it's rather complicated, via his older half-brother Lawrence, who died before the war, of, probably of uh, tuberculosis. And when Lawrence dies, and then his widow dies, and his young daughter dies, the estate of Mount Vernon then comes to George. It's a process that takes a number of years. George actually rents the estate for a time before it actually finally comes fully into his possession. Now he also, in 1759, in January, he marries a woman named Martha, Dan Martha Dandridge Custis. Martha is very much in many ways like George's mother. He's very much like the other women in the Washington family in that, you know, we, we look at their, their marriage and we say Martha was the wealthiest widow in Virginia when George pursued her. And we think she just kind of stood there supine and George went up and snatched her and carried her off. Well, she had a choice to make too. They chose each other. They chose each other for a number of reasons. Yes, I think it's safe to say from George's perspective, she had a vast estate that had come down uh, to her from her first husband that he was able then to not completely claim, but he was able to use to build his estate and his wealth. But he also saw her as a worthy partner, as a woman who, like his mother, was tough-minded, who was a good manager, and who would be able to help manage the estate. There's a great uh, collection of uh, documents. After Martha's first husband dies, Daniel Park Custis, um, Martha writes a couple of letters to the uh, British uh, merchants who had been managing their trade overseas. And she just says in no uncertain terms, I'm in charge now. I'm taking this over. You're going to have to deal with me. So she was that type of person. And I think from her perspective, George was a man who knew what he wanted, who was on the make, so to speak, who wanted to improve, who wanted to provide for his heirs. Now, if, if he had been somebody who was just motivated by personal wealth and greed, I think that would have turned her off. She had children of her own. They would have children of her own. George was focused on providing for his heirs. And she knew that he would be a smart, prudent manager, unlike a lot of other Virginians who, who ruined their wealth with carelessness. So they're married, and they return to Mount Vernon. And Washington in the early 1760s begins to work on building up his estate. Now, he, there are a number of things that he takes for granted. One is slavery, and I'll return to that in a moment. Another thing he takes for granted at first is tobacco. Tobacco has been everything for generations. His family has been founded on tobacco. But he begins to see in this period that tobacco isn't working anymore. And there are a number of reasons for it. One is tobacco really drains the soil, it ruins the soil quickly. And all you can do in the, you know, the simplistic mindset of that time is you clear more land, you plant more tobacco, it, it, you know, sucks the land dry, you clear more land, you plant more tobacco. That's pretty wasteful. Another thing is that tobacco is very labor intensive. It takes a lot of labor to produce. But from George's point of view, the worst thing is that tobacco ties him to the British mercantilist credit system. Now what this means is that if you're a planter and you want to sell your tobacco, you can't just, and there are different varieties of tobacco, by the way. Some are better than others. And you can't just develop new technology and improvise, and you can sell it in different ways. You can find, well, here's a better market. Maybe there's a great market in France, a great demand for tobacco in the Caribbean. You can't do that. You have to sell through specially appointed British agents who take your tobacco. They ship it overseas in British ships to Britain. And they sell it where they see fit for whatever prices they can find. And then what do they give you, the Virginia planter, in return? They give you credit. Now what had happened, I talked about the Virginia gentry being about appearances. This is a conspicuous consumption 
culture. The gentry take this credit and they buy luxury goods. It's not the same as we think oh, you're buying manufactured goods in Britain, the things that you need. They buy luxury goods. They buy, buy clothes. They buy fine carriages. They buy all kinds of baubles and, and fine things to eat and fine wine and stuff to drink. It reduces them to debt. Dozens of, Briti of uh, Virginia planters who were Washington's friends are ruined by that debt. And they have to hold lotteries, which are essentially fire sales, to sell off their land holdings. And they have nothing. Their, their whole careers are over. Washington makes a quick decision. He says, I can't bear this. And he's starting to fall into debt, too. He says, this is not going to work. And he switches to wheat. It, it was like many things that Washington did, and, and in his business ventures as well, is he, when he had to make a decision, he studied it very carefully first. And that's what he did, does with this. Studies it very carefully, but then when he makes a decision, I'm going to wheat, that's it. He switches over almost his entire estate, and Martha's as well, to wheat. Okay, sounds good, right? But there are a lot of repercussions of this. One, the most important one, is that now he can produce and he can sell and he can trade on his own account for cash through American merchants throughout North America. He buys expensive French millstones to construct a new effective uh, productive grist mill at Mount Vernon. So he can mill a lot of flour and he can sell that flour. There's actually George Washington brand flour that he sells through the Caribbean and he sells throughout North America. But Mount Vernon is transformed within a couple of years, not just from the flour, but because he's able to move from a more labor intensive to a less labor intensive production. Now, all the time of the enslaved people on his estate and the workers on his estate Instead of just working on tobacco, they can produce for themselves. Very soon, they're producing, they're spinning, and they're weaving, they're producing their own clothing, and they're selling that clothing to other estates. They're cobbling their own shoes. The blacksmith operation expands dramatically, and all the iron working that's going on there, they can produce and repair their own tools and equipment and sell them as well. The fishery is established and expanded Millions of fish, those shad coming up the Potomac. It's nothing like today, alas, but when George saw the Potomac River in those days, just millions upon millions of fish teeming through the river, leaping into the air. He establishes a fishery there, which feeds his own people, and also they can sell abroad. And he's beginning to develop that, develop that production. Now, very briefly, in the, the lead up to the Revolutionary War, um, what Washington sees here, and, and many Americans see, is that the, the British are denying us of our right to produce our own wealth, to invest our own money, to, to establish our own prosperity, and to become free in that way. Now, I mentioned earlier and this, I'll touch on this with slavery, too, in a moment. Washington believed that morality and industry were two sides of the same coin. This is fundamental with him. The industrious man is a moral man by virtue of his industry, his work, his hard work, his production. A moral man will naturally want to work and will want to produce. If you deny a individual, an individual, the ability to work and to produce and to develop, you corrupt him. Now, he doesn't see the problem with slavery right yet, but he will later on. He's looking at this problem for himself and for his fellow white Virginians right now, that the British credit system and the British restrictions on westward expansion British restrictions on the development of American currency, all of the other restrictions, 
prevent us from achieving that and leave us in a form of bondage. It's that calculus, that basic calculus that leads him in his mind to the idea of the need for political freedom. Political freedom gives us the right to determine the terms of our own production and prosperity. What really turns him against the British are the British reactions. Yes, the Stamp Act, the Townsend duties, all of those things upset him very much because they're signs of more of the same thing. But when the British begin to take punitive measures against American commerce, closing the port of Boston, for example, that's what drives George into a frenzy. He said, you're trying to shut down our economy. There's a, a national sense that we've reached takeoff, to use a modern term. We've reached takeoff as a people, as Americans. We're about to begin to really become a prosperous people who can develop our agriculture, our industry, and the British are holding us back. That's, it's that kind of very simple calculus that determines Washington's ultimate reaction against British rule. Now he believes first and foremost that our resistance to British rule should be based on economic warfare. And here I'll backtrack just, just a moment. When you look at Washington, if you want to understand him for all of his life after he was in his mid-20s, for the whole remainder of his life, you have to remember he is a combat veteran. That's, that's essentially important to his outlook and to his worldview. He has been in combat, not just as an officer, not just directing men, but he has personally been in combat. He's not been wounded, almost miraculously, but he has seen, as he wrote about after the French and Indian War, the cries of the wounded, the suffering, everything else. But he also experienced the comradeship. He also experienced all those different aspects. But what it comes down to is that he understands what war is really about. Unlike many others, you can, you can praise men, and we should, like Patrick Henry, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson and the others to the skies for the great things that they did. None of them understood anything about war. They didn't know what it did. And uh, Washington believed we should avoid a physical military conflict with the British almost at all costs. Almost at all costs. That it should be an economic war to teach the British that they need to give us our freedom. Now, when it turns into a physical military conflict, he accepts and he goes along with that. Um, but, but in the war, and I'll just talk about the war very briefly before I move to the presidency so I can give time for questions. In the war, as commander in chief of the Continental Army, Washington sees a basic goal a basic aspiration. We're not just in this to beat the British on the battlefield. That's not the only reason why we're here. We're here to create a nation. And the British begin to make war, particularly in, in destroying our towns and destroying our commerce. That's what really turns Washington toward the belief we have to be independent. But then he thinks, okay, look here. We're creating a government, we're creating an economy we're, we're creating an army and a navy and everything else. We're creating a society. We're trying to build a nation. If you defeat the British, but you destroy your country at the same time, what have you got? There were those who urged Washington to prolong the war, who urged him to engage in a guerrilla conflict, a type of really down and dirty, vicious, no holds barred conflict that would have absolutely no boundaries to really punish the British and get them to leave. Washington says, no. We do that, 
We might defeat the British, but we'll destroy ourselves in the process. We must build our infrastructure and economy while we're winning this war. That's why he fights a war that's very principled, that's very conventional. That's why he refuses to do things like seizing goods from American civilians. We've got to build a country here. And there's another thing from the war that comes out that, that I think is fascinating. I found this phrase. There's a letter early on in 1776 where Washington says, interest is the guiding principle of humankind. And I originally looked at it and I thought, well, this is pretty, a pretty cynical statement because he's saying everybody's in it for themselves. And the more I looked at it, though, in, in the process of writing this book, I saw that Washington believes self-interest is a natural thing. It's not necessarily good. It's not necessarily bad, but it's natural. Human beings look at themselves. They look at their, their own selves, their families, their communities. Think of the Revolutionary War. Think of the women of America if they had decided this war is no longer worth fighting. They were the ones who were experiencing on the ground all of the aspects of war's suffering and hardship, you know, with their, with their farms, with their families, with their communities, and seeing them suffering. If they decided that we're going to be ruined, that war would have ended, no matter what we were doing on the battlefield. The American people Men and women were choosing every moment to continue. And if you face them with ruin, no matter how patriotic they are, a lot of people didn't understand this at the time. They thought patriotism is everything. If you believe in the cause, you will overcome. Even if you starve to death, even if your children die, even if your business is ruined, even if you're impoverished, does that mean you're not a patriot? If you say, stop, I don't want my family to be ruined. That's what self-interest is about. You need to show people that they can build and they can grow, that there's a purpose to this. But he also uses this phrase, community of interest, communities of interest. How do you convince Americans not to accept British rule? How do you convince them not to trade with the British? You trade with them yourself. You maintain a stable economy. When you, when you establish your camp, every camp Washington's army establishes, he sets up a market to trade with the people, to maintain that interaction so that we have a community of interest, a common interest that we see we're in this together. It's in all of our interests to remain unified and to continue the fight. So the war ends. And uh, we can get more to this in Q&A, but after the war in the Confederation period, uh, Washington sees that lack of stability. The currency has collapsed practically during the war. It reaches a point where you have to pay a few hundred thousand dollars to buy, to buy a horse or to buy a wagon or anything like that. It, inflation is insane. Uh, and after the war, stability, the currency is still a mess. We still have state currencies. We still have a government that can't raise taxes on its own account. So currencies are very volatile. Uh, Washington tries to develop his own estate, to build, to adapt new technologies. He brings scientific farming, the new husbandry to Mount Vernon, establishes a lot of new industries. But he sees instability of the economy, and he also sees political instability, and worst of all, the potential for unrest and war. Washington is a man of peace. And I would, I would keep repeating that if I had more time. He is a man of peace. Peace is essential to prosperity. When he sees things like Shays' Rebellion in 1786, uh, an uprising, an anti-tax uprising in western Massachusetts, he's terrified. This will undermine the very foundations of our freedom. So that's why he's such a passionate believer. He doesn't think the Constitution is perfect, but he's a passionate believer in ratification. As president, and I will end with this, to give you a few basic principles of his goal as president. 
when he accepts the presidency in 1789, and he's, he's inaugurated, he writes, to establish the national prosperity, and this is a literal quotation, to establish the national prosperity should be my first, my only aim. To establish the national prosperity. How does he do that? Despite what some people say, he was not Alexander Hamilton's cipher. He didn't just say, Alex, tell me what to do. Whatever you say, I'll go with it. He gives Hamilton a vision, and he gives Jefferson a vision. He knows that Jefferson and Hamilton hate each other from the very beginning. He says, okay, that's all right. This happens. We want men of genius in this government who have Yes, very fundamental, basic differences in their outlook, but they have the same goal, to create a great nation. You can, you can build off that tension and that energy between Hamilton and Jefferson and the others, and you can build from that. It, it absolutely devastates him when later on the two of them tear the country apart and tear politics into faction. But he believes with, with Hamilton, establish a vision. The vision is stability, stable currency, stable economy. The government should be able to tax, but why does the government tax? The government brings taxes in to maintain domestic peace, to maintain international peace, and to create a level playing field at home so that Americans can produce their own wealth. Sounds simplistic, that's what he believed. The people produced the wealth, the government's role is to, yes, it needs taxes, it needs to be stable, it needs to be strong. But its goal with the people and prosperity, create stability, create a situation where capital is readily available, people can invest and they can grow. And he's successful in that. Now let me say one thing about slavery. And, and I'll finish up, and then we'll, we'll have time for questions. Uh, Washington turns against slavery, and it really in the 1770s, 1780s. Now, I'm not going to excuse the fact that he was a slaveholder. The truly great people, the truly great people don't just reflect their times, they transcend their times. And in many ways, Washington did, but with slavery, he did not at first. He didn't recognize the moral evil of slavery right away. But what turned him against slavery ultimately was that principle of you're telling these people that they have to work or else they'll be punished. Does that give them any motivation? No. It corrupts them. It corrupts those who force them in the system. And ultimately, it's an economic dead end. By the 1790s, he believed slavery would bring us down to stagnation and destruction, economically. Um, and so that's why in his will, he mandated that his slaves should be freed after Martha's death. She didn't like that too much, so she, she freed them right away. But I think in, in Washington's vision, his sense as a business person, uh, his understanding of money really was the foundation of our national prosperity. So thank you very much. I will end with that, and I'm happy to take questions. All right. Yes, go to the microphone, please. Greetings. So uh, could you say a little bit more about slavery, how much of Washington's wealth was in slavery, and how essential was it to his success? And was it realistic, if the slaves were all gone, that his estate could prosper? So um, you have to realize that the, the enslaved people on his state ultimately created his wealth. These were the, the men and the women and the children who worked and who produced and who grew for him. And we neglect that reality at you know, our peril, and it's, it would be wrong to neglect that. He held ultimately, I, I can't remember the figure off the top of my head, a few hundred slaves. Uh, many of them were his own. Others came as dower slaves from uh, Martha's 
family. Um, so they were important um, to, to building his wealth. The, the standard of the time was to think of them, okay, they're free labor. Isn't it better just to have slaves and have free labor uh, instead of having to pay people to work? It's a money-saving device, you know, that's very simplistic. Washington looked at it eventually. He believed that at first, and he believed it for quite a while. He looked at it eventually as something that in the long term, he saw that why are these, these enslaved people not working the best they can? And we know now they were resisting constantly. Every little moment they pushed back, it was an act of resistance. He saw, why should they work? Why should they want to work? They're always going to do the least possible. And you can never really achieve everything that you want to achieve if that's the basis of your motivation. So he, he tried to think over the long term. Uh, so that's a, very, that's a very brief answer to your question. Yes, sir. A couple of questions. First, you alluded to the tension between Mary Ball and George uh, later in life. Now, Mary, Mary Ball was, as I understand, a notorious Tory during the revolution. I was just wondering, what was, what was up with that, and how did, they, how did they resolve that, or did they resolve that tension between them? And the other one, following up on the slavery question, some authors have uh, credited the Lafayette with really inspiring uh, uh, Washington to rethink the whole question, the whole issue of slavery, uh, and its morality, and so forth, and the whole spirit of the Enlightenment. Do you think that played a major factor, or just a kind of a sidelight? Okay, so the, the first question with, with Mary Ball, uh, their tension began early. Uh, she was always stopping him from doing the things he really wanted to do, <laughs> to look at it simply. He wants to go off to sea. She says no. Uh, she got really mad when he went off to the French and Indian War, and he had to excuse it constantly every time he went back because uh, she, th she thought he should be focused on what's important, his estate and, and building and growing. Uh, so they were very tense already well before the war in the 1760s. She was not welcome at Mount Vernon very much. Uh, I suspect Martha and Mary didn't get along too well. But during the, um, during the Revolutionary War, um, she did the worst possible thing that she could do for him, which was to appeal to the Virginia Assembly for support, financial support implying that George was not giving her what she needed to, uh, to get by. And that, was, that just infuriated him, because uh, it was a public humiliation. Um, so they never really reconciled. Now, on the, on the slavery question, um, yes, Lafayette, also men like John Lawrence, his aide from South Carolina, uh, John and Henry Lawrence, two, two great people, um, South Carolinians who really argued against slavery. Yes, they played a role, but I, I think for Washington, if you look at what held him back, he was a law and order guy. And he feared, and I'm just being very forthright, he was afraid of what would happen if you let these people free. That uh, the ideal was there, the understanding of the, the economic principle was there, you let these people free, anything can happen, and social dislocation was, was what he feared. A uh, yes. comment and then a question. Uh, the comment is that I seem to recall reading at one point that uh, George Washington wrote uh, to uh, his, uh, the, the overseers that whenever possible they were to reward good work by the kind of thing that appealed to that particular slave, that it might be a, a, a shirt, an extra shirt for one person, it might be ex being excused early to be able to go home and visit uh, the family on the other farm, uh, or something of that sort of motivation, in incentive. Uh, that's my comment, uh, which I would be interested in hearing what you have to say on that. The question that has uh, been in my mind for a long time is that one of the biggest mistakes that I think that he made in his life was putting into his will the fact that um, around 100 people were going to be freed when that lady died. And the idea that she would be safe under those circumstances doesn't sound to me like anything that he thought through. Martha would agree with you completely. <laughs> so yes, he, he did try to find other ways to motivate them. Um, he also provided 
very well for his uh, body servant, uh, William or Billy Lee, who stayed with him constantly throughout the war, and, and George provided for him financially for the remainder of his life. On the other hand, and you just have to say this is reality, um, there's a very, very unpleasant letter. If you go to the, uh, the Washington Papers blog, it's called Washington's Quill. One of my uh, colleagues wrote a blog on this. In the 1790s, his farm manager, Anthony Whiting, writes to George and says, you know, I'm, I'm just very upset with this slave. I think her name was Charlotte, that she's not doing what I tell her to do. She's resisting constantly. And he whipped her. You know, he, he thrashed her, uh, flogged her. And uh, George writes back to him saying, I approve. Uh, now, he didn't, so far as I know, George did not um, order this to be done himself, but just that fact that his farm manager did it, and he said, I approve, no, there's no, there's no excuse for that. I, I can't excuse it. That doesn't mean I believe Washington was an evil or a bad man, but he was a human being, and he had a lapse, a pretty serious lapse there. So he was torn with slavery. Slavery was... Um, um, one of the great moral quandaries of his life, and he did not always respond. He often did not respond the way he should have. He appointed his second cousin, Lund Washington, as caretaker of Mount Vernon during the Revolution. And I was wondering how much the same or different was Lund Washington's vision and practice as his, as his cousin George. Sure, that's a that's a good question. And uh, Lund Lund's task was to maintain the estate and to keep it from falling apart. Uh, and there's some interesting correspondence. You know, the, the currency was becoming worthless during the war. The patriotic thing to do was to keep using that currency, because the less you use the paper currency, the more worthless it becomes, right? George is leading the Continental Army. He should be, still be using this currency, even if it means his own ruin. He writes to Lund, and he says, there's nothing we can do about it get rid of your currency and buy land. And that's one of the things Lund does. He, he uses every bit of currency he can find to buy land. Also um, trades in uh, enslaved people to buy land uh, and other commodities because he believes that's a safe thing to do. Lund maintains the estate. He keeps it from completely falling apart. But when George gets home, he's pretty disappointed because the building is dilapidated. Um, it's, it's livable, but it's not really um, in very good shape. I think if Martha had stayed home, she would have done a much better job with it. Uh, but she was with George all the time uh, in, the, in the encamp, or m most of the time she spent with him. And Lund's worst mistake is that when the British, I think this was 1781, a British warship sails up the Potomac and sets anchor, weighs anchor right off Mount Vernon. And Lund is terrified that they're going to come and they're going to burn the estate. So he bribes the British. He sends out all these uh, commodities like roast chicken and uh, uh, all types of other stuff to make the British happy and hams and stuff like that. Uh, Please don't burn Mount Vernon. I'll give you anything you want. And they don't burn Mount Vernon and they, they eat their chicken and they sail off. And uh, when George hears about this, he's apoplectic. He's, he would much rather Mount Vernon had been burned than, uh, than have the British bribed not to burn it. So Lund had to eat some humble pie for a long time for that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>